Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, an engineer's design guide for heat sinks and heat pipes, sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies and TechBreeze Media Group. I'm Billy Hurley, Associate Editor with TechBreeze Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Our webcast will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webcast. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. This time I'd like to introduce our speakers. Brian Muzika, Sales Engineer of the Electronics Products Group at Advanced Cooling Technologies, graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Penn State University. He worked as research and development engineer for ACT's Aerospace Group before taking on his current sales engineer role. Brian has firsthand experience designing, analyzing, and integrating heat pipes into real-world applications. Also on the line for our Q&A is Scott Garner. Scott Garner is VP and manager of the EP Group. He has 20 years' experience in the field of heat transfer and thermal management. He's an inventor on 14 patents and has written a variety of technical publications and chaired and co-chaired numerous sessions on thermal management for a variety of professional conferences. His expertise is in working with customers to integrate heat pipes and two-phase heat transfer systems into electronics cooling systems. So at this time, I'd like to hand the webcast over to our speaker, Brian Muzika. Brian? Thank you, Billy. And as Billy said, this is a design guide for heat sinks and heat pipes. It is kind of a high-level design guide, um, basically a heat pipe and heat sink 101 type course. So if you have any detailed questions that might go more in depth than we're going to get into in this presentation, please feel free to ask those questions or contact us at a later time, and we'd be happy to get you responses to those. So with that, I'll just show a quick presentation overview. Basically, we'll start with kind of an overview of the problems from an electronics standpoint and talk about the thermal resistance network going from that source electronics to the ambient air. Um, and then we'll get into kind of our two different sections, which is the first one, heat sink design, and the second one, heat pipe design. And then we'll kind of tie those together with a, um, an, an example of a case study analyzing a heat sink. So as a quick overview to, to heat sinks, the <clears throat> primary goal here is to make sure that electronics do not exceed their maximum operating temperatures. Um, typical electronics will have specified maximum case temperatures, and these can range anywhere from 70 to 100 degrees C. Uh, in air-cooled systems, which we'll be talking at length in today, the basic um, parameters require a sufficient amount of volume and delta T, or temperature difference from your case temperature to ambient temperature, um, to operate safely. The typical areas of improvement, which we'll touch on today, include the thermal interface material, or TIM material, the heat spreading within the heat sink itself, and then the fin design. Here, this slide touches on the thermal resistance network of a heat sink. The um, blue block labeled one there show, it gives a representation of your electronics device. The um, yellowish orange block um, is your thermal interface material, and your heat sink is the finned um, piece above that. And then the area labeled four is your ambient air temperature. So as you can see on the bottom, it gives you a representative thermal resistance network um, going all the way from the junction of the electronics to the ambient air temperature. The first thermal resistance um, in there is your thermal resistance from case to junction. And this is typically specified by your electronics manufacturer and is typically very consistent. So you'll have a very um, hard value to go on there. So usually you can design to the case temperature of the electronics. The second resistance there is the thermal interface material resistance, and we'll get into a couple of rules of thumb there to help you select um, the proper thermal interface material. Um, the third thermal resistance is the base temperature to the fin, so that's basically conduction within your, or within your metal heat sink, um, and that can vary based on your material properties and other things, and we'll talk about integrating heat pipes in the second session to increase that conductivity and reduce that thermal resistance. 
and the final thermal resistance is rejecting your heat to um, ambient air, and that's usually convection or radiation off the fin stack. So in the next section, we'll talk about some um, designs pertinent to heat sinks. The first area uh, we'll talk about is basically going right down the thermal resistance network, touching on the TIM selection, TIM choices. We'll then look at volumetric thermal resistance tools that will allow you to properly size your heat sink. And then we'll look at um, some fin options, different selections you may have for fins. Finally, we'll look at a case study that shows um, some thermal testing. And within that case study, we'll look at optimizing your fin pitch um, to better reject the heat to the ambient air. So the first area to look at is the thermal interface material. And TIM materials are used for two primary reasons. The first one is shown in that figure to the right is to reduce the air gaps um, caused by surface roughness or surface imperfections um, from your heat sink or your electronics packaging. And the second um, reason is to bridge the CTE gap. So typically a electronics mounting device will be silicon based and have a very low uh, CTE, which is thermal expansion coefficient and your heat sink will have a very high CTE. So there is a gap there that could cause failure if you directly bond one to another. Therefore, um, a, a thermal interface material can alleviate the CTE difference as well as reduce the air gaps within that surface roughness. Some of the common TIM materials include gap pads, um, which are basically small foam type pads that um, compress down between your heat sink and your electronics a thermal grease, which is somewhat of a paste that you can spread on and um, have the electronics touch the heat sink with, a foil um, similar to like an aluminum foil or a graphite foil that can do the same, same type thing, and a phase change material that can alter phases between solid and liquid for um, various performance enhancements during, uh, during liquefaction. Um, some of the key areas of TIM performance include bond line thickness and thermal conductivity. Typically what you'll see is that um, you can select it off based on highest thermal conductivity, but oftentimes um, if you have a thicker bond line, that thermal conductivity enhancement um, does not pay off as well as if you had a lower thermal conductivity and a thinner bond line. So it's kind of a trade-off there to look at and decide which is your best foot forward. Now the next area we'll touch on is the volumetric um, thermal resistance calculations, and this is a good first tool to sizing an overall heat sink. So um, airflow condition will basically determine what your, what your overall volumetric thermal resistance is, and from the required delta T, which you know because you know your maximum electronics temperature and you know your ambient temperature, you can come up with a uh, given volume. So you can see the equation there. We have that the, the volume is equal to the power times the thermal resistance divided by the temperature difference um, in your system. <clears throat> the, um, the chart you see on the bottom is um, uh, fairly reliable published data for uh, volumetric thermal resistances. Um, you can see there going from natural convection to any type of system that has airflow is a big drop in volumetric thermal resistance. So the addition of, of fans or blowers can, can greatly reduce your overall size of your heat sink required. This next slide talks about some of the different fin options that um, engineers can consider when designing a heat sink. Um, each fin option has um, various different benefits and drawbacks. Um, we're just going to touch on a couple of the, of the driving benefits to each design. Um, Machine fins is a very good, quick, um, easy turnaround type, type product. You can design them. You can send them to a machine shop, have them manufactured very quickly with um, low non-recurring cost. The second item there is extruded fins. They uh, will have volume cost benefits. They typically have an NRE charge with them, but um, at, at volume they make sense to, to be looked at for a heat sink design. Bonded fins 
um, typically high performance and design flexibility. So some aspect ratios that might not be possible with extruded or machine fins can be possible with a bonded type fin. Um, folded fins, um, an example of a folded fin can see in that middle picture to the right. The big enhancement there is additional surface area um, for improved performance. And then the, um, another option is pin fins, which is the figure to the bottom. And the big enhancement with pin fins is that you can have variable flow directions. So no matter if your um, airflow is coming in um, from the top to the bottom or from the left to the right in that figure, you, your fins will allow for um, good dissipation. So now we'll talk about a quick case study um, looking at a heat sink design. In this case, we had 150 watts um, that needed to be dissipated. It was 150 watts, um, which is a representative of one electronics chip, and it was a natural convection setting. So the room temperature ambient was about 23 degrees, and we selected an off-the-shelf heat sink um, sized about 7 inches by 2.8 inches by 12 inches. And the fin pitch in this case was 8 millimeters, um, basically for availability and, um, and for a nice demonstration piece. So looking at the next slide, we have uh, what we did was took that heat sink and we tested it with a FLIR IR camera, which captured the temperature profile along the entire heat sink. Now what we show here is an 87 uh, degree temperature at the electronics, which is a rise of about 64 degrees from ambient temperature. We estimated a certain amount of temperature rise in other areas, including the thermal interface and conduction. And what we did is we backed out a thermal resistance um, that you can see there of about 1,300 to 1,600 centimeter cube degrees C per watt. Um, and what this shows is because it's higher than the natural convection volumetric resistance we showed a couple slides ago, um, it's showing that your fins are not very optimized for the natural convection setting. So in this next slide, what we want to show is how fin pitch um, and thickness are important design characteristics to optimal heat transfer performance. So we took the original design point of um, 8 millimeter fin pitch and we optimized it, um, and you can see kind of the heat sink design curve. Typically in natural convection settings, um, fins spaced farther apart reject heat better um, because if you have fins too tightly packed, they tend to choke flow, um, which causes large temperature rises. And you can see the optimal here was a little over 13 millimeter fin pitch. And if you were to use that as opposed to the one that we showed uh, with an 8 millimeter fin pitch, you're, about, you're getting about a 10 degree savings, so pretty significant savings just by uh, sizing your fins correctly. So now we want to show um, what happens if your, your fins are sized correctly and you're still not getting to the performance you needed. So here what we're showing is a pretty concentrated load in a um, extruded fin stack, and this was a fin stack for a single IGBT mounted to it. And with IGBTs, you have a very concentrated load, um, high, high power is going into that heat sink, and what you had was a, um, a hot spot right in the center, and it wasn't able to spread the heat out to the outside fins to reduce the temperature enough to a safe operating temperature. So that transitions us into the second part of the presentation, which goes into heat pipe design and how to improve that conduction gradient. So here we'll talk about, I will give an overview of heat pipes and performance predictions there. We'll talk about designing and modeling with heat pipes. We'll look at the thermal conductivity enhancements you can have in relation to your heat sink design. And then we'll revisit the case study with increased um, thermal conductivity, and we'll also look at ways to reduce weight and optimize performance um, with heat pipes. So real quick, back to that extruded heat sink for the IGBT. Um, the figure on the left uses a bare aluminum, while the figure on the, on the right shows the enhancements that could be had with heat pipes, basically improved condu conduction, um, and spreading out of that 
um, concentrated load, and it allows your fins to operate more efficiently and, over, and, and basically reduce your operating temperature of your electronics. So how is this accomplished? The um, big advantage to a heat pipe is that it's still a passive system. You, going from a natural convection heat sink to a heat pipe heat sink, you're not adding any additional power like you would with a fan. You're just getting impre improved performance um, based on increased conduction rates. So the, the passiveness is because it's a sealed closed loop device. What happens internally is that you place your evaporator end by the electronics and it vaporizes an internal working fluid. For most systems, that working fluid is water because of water's good thermal properties and good surface tension properties, um, but it can be, the, the working fluid can vary based on your temperature requirements. Um, you vaporize the fluid at the evaporator end. It forms an internal pressure gradient that spreads the vapor to the opposing end. Um, at the opposing end, which you're typically connected to, like your fin side, you would <clears throat> condense that fluid back into a liquid form and it would be absorbed into the wick structure. The wick structure would then pump that um, fluid with a, using a capillary force um, back to the evaporator. The wick structure is typically a fine pore radius material. It could be a centered powder, it could be a, a simple groove, or it could be some sort of screen mesh. Um, and, and basically it, it creates that capillary force that drives that liquid back, um, similar to dipping a paper towel into like a glass of water and watching the um, fluid wick up the paper towel. Very similar principles, um, but it allows for you to have passive um, liquid return and operate um, very efficiently. So when in your system, a heat pipe will typically have somewhere between a two to five degree temperature difference across the length of the pipe, um, which at, at pretty much any length will give you increased performance to a bulk metal. So the big advantages of a heat pipe are, as we mentioned, the effective thermal conductivity. Um, this can range anywhere from 10,000 um, for like a short six, mil, or six inch pipe to 200,000 for some of the longer pipes that are used in um, things like satellite systems on, on space, on, uh, orbiting space. Um, the second big benefit is that they're passive, so they're not adding any additional power or um, cost to your system, and they provide good isothermality characteristics, so they keep things at, at very constant temperatures. Um, heat pipes are governed by several limitations. The biggest limit we want to point out from a design perspective is the capillary limit. For terrestrial systems, the capillary limit is typically the first um, limit you'll hit, and this is basically the wick's ability to overcome the various pressure drops in the system. So your, your wick structure will form a capillary pressure, and that pressure must be higher than your pressure drops, um, which include the vapor pressure drop, the liquid return pressure drop, and then the pressure drop um, from gravity. So when we design heat pipes, we'll look at the worst case orientation, and we'll design accordingly. And some of the tools you can use um, is the heat pipe calculator, which we'll show in the next slide. And then we'll get into kind of a design guide on how you can size and, and fit heat pipes into your system. So getting into the design guide, there's basically um, three main steps to designing heat pipes within your system. The first step is to assure that heat pipes can move the total power for your design requirements. Um, and this will input um, size, orientation, and various um, things, and it'll output kind of the, the capillary curve. And one of the tools that ACT has created to help with that is an online heat pipe calculator where design engineers can actually go in and, and um, calculate these capillary limits and then pick the appropriate amount of heat pipes and size of heat pipes that they want for their system. The second step is fitting heat pipes into your system, and we have a design guide online that talks about bending, flattening, and various integration techniques. And then the third technique is performance predictions. If you want to predict the performance of your system, we have some modeling guidelines um, in here as well as online that can, that can help engineers model heat pipes for their various system parameters. 
Um, this is a screenshot of what our calculator will output. The items you see in red, which are length, um, evaporator length, condenser length, and then orientation, which is the uh, amount of um, the length against gravity the heat pipe will operate at. And basically, it'll output a curve of various diameter heat pipes and the capillary limits associated with that curve. So if you know your operating temperature limit, in this case, we were looking at something in between 60 and 80 degrees, you can see um, where, what size heat pipes you would need um, for various powers. And in this case, we were looking at about a 50-watt transport requirement, and we would size somewhere above that, for, so maybe a 6-millimeter or a quarter-inch heat pipe. The next slide is the heat pipe design guide. Um, this talks about some standard heat pipe sizes and some bending and flattening rules of thumb. The bending rule of thumb that we typically use is to bend um, no tighter than three times the outside diameter of the heat pipe. Um, any, you, you can go slightly tighter than that. However, you will see, eventually see some crinkling in the copper. Um, flattening profile, typically you don't want to go any flatter than two-thirds times the outside diameter. Um, there you are kind of changing the shape of the heat pipe, which will affect the, the vapor space internally. Um, so a good rule of thumb is two-thirds times the outside diameter. Some of the integration techniques that are used with heat pipes are um, primarily solder and epoxy. Epoxy is a nice, quick, and easy way to, way to integrate. Solder is often a better joint and uh, thermally a better joint as well. And some of the items for um, reliability you can see there, we have some reliability guides online that talk about various shock and vibration and different performance parameters that uh, you can look at on your own time. So here we have some basic modeling techniques. Um, one, of the, one of the easiest modeling techniques is to assume heat pipes are a solid element and then um, increase or decrease the conductivity until you get a two to five degree temperature difference across the length. And typically a good starting point is about 10,000 and then adjust accordingly. Um, this is a nice easy way for, for engineers to model heat pipes in their system. The next slide here just talks about high K plates. This is um, an ACT term for high conductivity which include embedded heat pipes into the plate. And this is where we'll, we'll take a lot of uh, where we'll look at a lot of different scenarios to increase base plate conductivity. Um, one of the areas we've improved on here is the plate thickness, and as we'll show later, this is a good way to reduce overall weight of your system. Um, but a high K plate, which includes um, heat pipes and solder, is basically the same weight as a bulk aluminum plate of the same size, and it typically has very similar structural strength. So you're not adding any weight or decreasing any strength, you're just increasing the overall conductivity of your plate. And that plate to the bottom right there, you can see in the next slide um, a thermal profile of that plate. And basically, by Im embedding heat pipes in there, you're able to reduce the temperature by about 20 degrees in that plate, so a very significant reduction in temperature. And that was a fairly high power application. Um, one, of, one of the other modeling techniques we had in this slide on the, that last bullet point there is if you're modeling high K plates, um, instead of modeling each individual heat pipe, one good way to, to look at it is just using a bulk conductivity of 600 watts per meter K. Um, that often, you know, that's a good rough estimate, but it often give you a very good result as a first iteration approach. Now we're gonna look at that case study one more time. Um, after optimizing the fin pitch, you might not have still been there um, as far as your performance. So what we looked at here was just doing exactly what I said last slide and increasing that base plate conductivity to 600 watts per meter K. And by doing that, we showed a 14% improvement um, over the, the um, baseline aluminum. Um, and, and what we wanted to show here is that Oftentimes, thermal performance is the driver in a design, um, but what we want to get into next is what happens if weight is the uh, overall driving force and your aluminum heat sink was operating okay, it was just too heavy. 
So here what we did is we used some of our in-house tools to design a heat pipe heat sink um, that would operate similar to aluminum, uh, to the aluminum heat sink we talked about earlier, but reduce the weight. And so we sized that heat sink. We were able to cut about um, three-tenths of an inch off the fin height and off the, off the base height, and we were able to reduce the overall length by about 1.7 inches. And overall, that was nearly a two-pound reduction, two reduction in weight. And this slide has the testing results, basically going back to that test we ran with the 12-inch length aluminum heat sink, and then we built that, um, that heat sink I showed last slide with the embedded heat pipes and reduced dimensions, and we tested it, and you can see that it has identical thermal performance as far as your electronics temperature goes. Um, you can see that there's not as much of a thermal gradient because of the improved spreading, um, but that just increased the fin efficiency and um, was able to hold your electronics temperature at the same, same temperature. So the conclusions and wrapping up, um, proper heat sink design is necessary for efficient air-cooled systems. Um, one of the takeaways is a quick tool using volumetric thermal resistance is readily available and um, good published data, and that can be used very easily. Um, one of the biggest steps is fin pitch optimi optimization, and that can provide significant improvements if you're seeing some sort of choked airflow or not getting to those published results. Um, the next area is that heat pipes can, <clears throat> can offer extreme heat transfer um, improvements, and if you're having some conduction-related issues, they can all, often offer three to four times the thermal conductivity of bare aluminum. Um, and the takeaways, now after watching this presentation, you should have the tools to size a proper heat sink, and you should also have the um, enough design guides to uh, size and route your heat pipes within your system and also do some basic modeling and performance predictions. So last slide, I just had some re references. We referenced a couple of electronics cooling articles. And at this time, we want to thank you for your time, and we would be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Brian. And this time, too, as we begin our q and I'd like to welcome back or welcome to the line Scott Garner, VP and Manager of the Electronics Product Group at Advanced Cooling Technologies. We also we have a few questions already in. Uh, the first question, can you define bond line thickness? Yeah, bond line thickness is the essentially the effective thickness of that interface material, whether it's a gap pad or a thermal grease. Um, Brian talked about the trade-off of conductivity and bond line thickness. Um, obviously, you want as high a conductivity and as thin a bond line or a thin, as thin a gap of interface material as you can achieve. Um, but they typically are fairly viscous uh, materials, so that bond line thickness is, is the thickness of that interface material, and it can be controlled by the amount of uh, tin material that you put down, the pressure, and the temperature at which your component is attached to your heat sink. This question came in about midway through the presentation. What was being held constant as the pin spacing was varied? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was a natural convection analysis, um, so there wasn't any airflow, velocity, or pressure drop requirement to hold constant. It was just a natural convection heat sink. So we varied the fin pitch and kept the fin thickness constant in that analysis. And as you can see from that curve, in this case, many times you want to add more surface area and more fins to dissipate heat load. But in natural convection, if you get those fins too close, you choke the airflow and it doesn't allow air to flow over your heat sink. So in this case, going to a wider pitch um, helped increase the airflow. We can do the same analysis with forced convection. And in that case, we would typically use a, uh, hold the fan curve constant. So we don't hold velocity or pressure drop, but we actually input the fan curve into the model, and then we can take a look at similar plots for uh, fin pitch and fin thickness to select the optimum fin for that uh, given geometry and selected fan. This will have to be our last question. It's from an attendee here. Have you used heat pipes along with thermoelectric generators? If so, what specific advantage has it offered? Yeah, uh, we have done that quite a bit um, on both sides of the thermoelectrics, both for generation and for cooling. 
So a thermoelectric generator, you input an electrical power and it'll force a temperature across it, or if you maintain a t delta T across it, it'll output some electrical power. We use them in some, some uh, government-funded R&D programs for waste heat recovery and integrated them with heat pipes. And again, we can put heat pipe heat sinks on either side, either picking up heat from, in that case, an exhaust stream and focusing it on the small surface area of thermoelectric. And also then on the back side, you need to dissipate that heat from the thermoelectric and uh, again, utilizing heat pipes to get to a much larger surface area than is available just off the uh, contact area of the thermoelectric itself. And many times, you know, you can put a thermoelectric directly on a device to maintain temperature control. And again, there that heat then needs to be dissipated from the backside of the thermoelectric and standard um, heat tanks as we talked about or heat pipe enhanced heat tanks can help dissipate that heat because you do need a much larger surface area to dissipate it to the air typically. All right, we'll have to end it there. That concludes today's webcast. Again, if we do not get a chance to answer your questions, our sponsors will do their best to address them after today's presentation. Our thanks to Brian Muzica, Scott Garner, and everyone for joining us. Just a reminder, this webcast will be available on demand at www.techbriefs.com for the next 12 months. Have a great day.